Hey there YouTube, what's up? And welcome to the video. Recently, I gave a talk about a month ago at TEDx MCKL, an independently sponsored TED event in the heart of Kuala Lumpur at a Methodist college. My talk was entitled, When Worlds Collide, The Connection Between Science and Science Fiction. Now, the event people made a video for it and uploaded to the official TED website, but their recording didn't get any footage of the slides, which I felt kind of took away from the overall presentation. It didn't, it didn't deliver the essence and feel of the full presentation without the images, accompanying images. And a big part of the presentation were the slides, so I took the liberty to add them as sort of like a remix video to my TED Talk in order to deliver you, the viewer, the full experience. And also some parts they cut out and some parts I didn't, I maybe forgot to say, I'm correcting that by putting them in now. So here goes my talk, When Worlds Collide, The Connection Between Science and Science Fiction. Walk up on stage like a boss, look at the crowd, take a pause and say... My name is Afik Abdul Hamid and I am a science communicator. I tell stories that involve strange theories and yet even stranger realities. Stories that may be made up of, of both fact and a little fiction and that may be set in the past or in a world of futurist predictions. But where my story aims to take all of us here today, ladies and gentlemen, is to the crossroads to the intersection of where the amazing worlds of science fiction meet our world of science fact. To see how their connection has shaped the world that we live in today and how it may shape the world of beyond today. And, okay, let's go. It was a dark and stormy night in 1898 and H.G. Wells had just written his book, The War of the Worlds, where he describes an alien invasion of planet Earth by Martians that possessed a highly advanced technology. The Martians were jealous of planet Earth because our planet was a fertile blue-green oasis, a jewel in the cosmos, while Mars was a barren and lifeless rock. So they came to Earth to destroy humans using heat rays and mechanical tripods that were every bit as terrifying to the characters in the book as a nuclear bomb would be to a Japanese city in 1945. In the end, it wasn't some miraculous invention of mankind that defeated the Martians, but it was the laws of evolution by natural selection. You see, unlike us humans that had lived on Earth for thousands of generations, the Martians had not developed an immunity to the billions of microscopic bacteria on our planet. And so, after a while, the Martians all got sick and died. The Earth was saved, and humanity lived happily ever after. What do you think of that story? Incredible, terrifying, kind of crazy. Well, the War of the Worlds, alongside other stories like The Time Machine and Rosam's Universal Robots and Jules Verne's From Earth to the Moon, represented a new direction in fiction called science fiction. These are stories that used science as a central element of the plot. And these stories were born about a hundred years ago at the turn of the century when our perceptions and understanding of science were starting to change. And in fact, The War of the Worlds was actually, the story in here was inspired by some real-life scientific discoveries at the time. It was the year 1877. Earth and Mars were at a close approach to each other. This close approach, or opposition as it's called in astronomy, opened a window that allowed us to see Mars easier, to make us, allowed us to make observations easier. And this was the image that we got of Mars using the best equipment that we had at that time. Due to a limitation in the resolution of the telescopes, which were clearly not as good as today, we found these streaks, these lines that crisscrossed the surface of Mars. 
And because of an error in translation, because they didn't have Google back then, these streaks and lines were thought to be canals or channels built by an alien civilization. One of those astronomers, his name was Percival Lowell, who would later help to discover Pluto, which is totally not a planet, by the way. It's a dwarf planet, a Kuiper Belt object. Now, he fully believed that these lines were canals, were built by an alien civilization trying to save planet Mars from drying up and dying out by channeling water flow, the key word is water flow, from the polar ice caps of Mars to the rest of the world. He was confident, he believed that these lines were evidence of an intelligent life that was capable of engineering on a planetary scale, sort of like how human beings are today. But we realized, but we know now that he was wrong and there was no life on Mars. But that did not stop the newspapers, the press at the time, from, from picking up and promoting this idea. The world was swept up by Mars mania. Everyone was imagining all sorts of ideas and conditions of what it was like on Mars or whether there was any life or not. At a time when we were only starting to understand our neighbor planet in the solar system. But it turns out that this whole idea about water flow on Mars wasn't so crazy after all. In 2011, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, that flew from Earth to take pictures of Mars using instruments that, that Percival Lowell could have only dreamed of, discovered these. What is that? This thing right here. That is seasonal water flow on Mars. Well, water is such a strong word. It's more of a salty fluid. You see, every Martian summer, and yes, Mars does have seasons that happen to be much longer than Earth season, the planet Mars gets warm enough to the point that some of the ice on the surface starts to melt. And some of this melt water slides down the, the slopes and hills on Mars, carrying with it a bit of uh, minerals and soil. Now, that sounds like the canal idea, doesn't it? we found the water flow, but the aliens have yet to show. Now, our understanding on planet Mars is still changing to this day, and this evidence has definitely shaped our opinion of whether there could be life on Mars. But lacking any concrete evidence for microbes or little green men, the search continues. This is one example of the connection between science and science fiction. Science fiction paints us a picture of a world that could possibly be. It shows us one possible reality. And then science, after doing away with the more ridiculous bits, shows us that reality with more confidence and clarity, with a higher degree of certainty. Now, H.G. Wells was among the first in a long line of sci-fi authors whose work would influence the world like this. Later on, we entered the golden age of sci-fi, influenced largely in part by an event that happened after the Second World War. And that is, on October 4th, 1957, we humans achieved something incredible. We became a spacefaring civilization. For the first time ever, the stars were no longer the exclusive domain of fiction, but we could actually begin our own journey to reach them. And just like how Sputnik brought us into a new age, the sci-fi stories after Sputnik also entered a new age. It wasn't enough that the characters in this new era of science fiction had to reach space, but they had to interact and partake in adventures that were literally from out of this world. And one of my favorite stories from this era was written by a man named Arthur C. Clarke. And it's called Rendezvous with Rama. Arthur C. Clarke was a radio engineer in World War II, and similarly, I majored in microwave communications because I thought that I could talk to aliens. <laughs> Seemed like a good idea at the time. Now, in Rendezvous with Rama, a mysterious cylindrical alien spacecraft enters our solar system from somewhere out there in the universe. The spacecraft is given a name, Rama, after the Hindu god. Now, after a preliminary reconnaissance by an unmanned, unmanned probe, a team of explorers is sent 
to investigate the spacecraft. This is Rama in miniature. And inside, they find an incredible artificial world complete with its own cities and oceans. But there was no sign of any intelligent life that could have created such a large spacecraft. It was discovered that Rama had a mind of its own. During its journey through the solar system, it frequently changes course mysteriously like that. And that caused the oceans inside Rama to swell and rage with waves due to the acceleration forces like that. So I thought that was a clever application of the laws of physics within the story. Now, towards the end of the story, the lights inside Rama start to dim, <laughs> which caused the temperature to drop to a point where the human explorers had to leave the ship or else risk freezing to death. In the end, Rama left as mysteriously as it came, leaving with it more questions than answers. Brilliant story, right? It's a sci-fi classic that has inspired generations of actual scientists after it. This is the sequel to the Rama story. I got this at Big Bad Wolf when I was still in university. Anyway, three years after the first rendezvous with Rama, another book comes out which I think was equally more remarkable, and that is The High Frontier by American physicist Gerard O'Neill from Houston, an American physicist. He's not, he's not a member of the Beatles, you might think he, he looks like that. <laughs> he's a, a physicist from Princeton University. And he wrote this book called The High Frontier that details how we, uh, human beings, might create similarly a cylindrical alien spaceship with its own artificial world inside that we could live inside. And he posed that design challenge as uh, coursework to his students. And together, they did the math and they did the research on how we might actually do this. These cylinders, that would be called O'Neill cylinders, would be given an, a, a slight spin like that to use centrifugal forces to impart the people inside with some measure of artificial gravity. So, you imagine that you are standing on the inside of a cylinder like this and it's rotating, your feet will actually be pushed upwards like that. So you, even though you're in space, you wouldn't float. You'd actually, your feet would be glued to the ground like that. That's how they generate the artificial gravity. And these O'Neill space cylinders would be placed in locations in space called Lagrange points, where the mutual gravity of the Earth, Moon, and Sun system is stable enough such that you don't drift away. Because imagine if you had a relative living there, their addresses would change and you couldn't find them. I'm at L2, Lagrange point L2, somewhere out there. <laughs> Ladies, call me. And uh, these cylindrical, uh, the proposed design by Gerard O'Neill would use reflecting mirrors to harvest sunlight for purposes ranging from bio hydrophonics. I'm not a biologist, my little brother is a yeah, little brother. Hydrophonics and water filtration systems. So it's really an incredible design, really, to think that maybe one day your descendants could wake up to something like this or this in the morning. Now, I'm not sure if there's a morning in space, but we'll, we'll figure that out when we get there. Now, all in all, there isn't much within the laws of physics that would prevent us from doing something like this. Now, there are a lot of engineering challenges that we'd have to solve along the way, such as how to make access to space easier already being done by Elon Musk and SpaceX. We'd have to figure out how to mine asteroids for resources and minerals. There was a TED talk on that by a Harvard astronomer three years ago. And we'd also have to set up, figure out how to set up a moon base, a base of operations on the moon. Now, that's a tricky one, but it isn't something that we aren't already trying to figure out or thinking about right now. So really, the reality is not too far from the fiction. By the way, I, I, got, I just got this book like last week. I haven't even opened it yet. And uh, this is Artemis by Andy Veer, the same author who wrote The Martian. Now, the reason why I name drop Andy Veer's book Artemis after mentioning this part is because the story in Artemis is set to take place in a city on the moon. So that ties in with the point about building a moon base. The movie that was, had Matt Damon in it and 
it's on my recommended reading list to anyone out there who's curious. Doesn't matter if you're in the sciences, maybe give, give this a read. Now, three years after Gerard O'Neill writes his book, The High Frontier, there was an anime released in Japan called Mobile Suit Gundam. Any of you guys watch it? No? Yes. And in the anime, he actually uses, the, the Japanese used some of his designs of the O'Neill cylinder as part of the story. See? That's pulled straight from the animation right there. So it's really brilliant how we have science fiction inspire some real science, which in turn go out to inspire some more science fiction. And the cycle continues, so on and so forth after that. Eventually, science fiction does its part to inspire the next generation of scientists, like me, people who work in the sciences. And those scientists go out to push the boundaries of real life science, of which science fiction is based on. So that's uh, it. And then when that happens, yesterday's sci-fi eventually becomes today's sci-fact. But you want to know the weird thing about the Rama story is that it actually kind of happened in real life. If you remember the news, sometime in October from last year, astronomers announced that they discovered this. It's called Oumuamua. <laughs> That's a really cute name. Everyone try saying it. Oumuamua. <laughs> yeah. And uh, which in Hawaiian stands for scout from our distant past. The reason why it has a Hawaiian name is because it was discovered by a telescope in Hawaii. It's not an alien ship like Rama, but instead an interstellar comet that had flown into our solar system from somewhere out there in the universe. And we managed to see it last October. It flew in to a point close to the sun. I mean, really close. This is the trajectory. It came in to within the orbit of Mercury. It's a really close call on its parabolic orbit right there. And it was flying really fast too, too fast to be caught by the gravity of our sun. And just like Rama, Oumuamua was strange. Its shape was elongated, like, like a sort of a space cucumber. And it, as it was flying, it had this tumbling motion about it, like it was spinning end over end like that. And as it was flying through the solar system, it started to accelerate for some strange reason. And that's because comets contain ice. And when Oumuamua was flying close to the sun, some of this ice sublimated into gas and then jettisoned out into space like a, like a space comet fart. <laughs> You're like, pfft, pfft, pfft. but you realize that there's no air in space, so it's more like <laughs> there's no sounds. It's like <laughs> okay, so oh yeah, here's the hot gassing effect. See that? That's where all the comet parts are. That this caused the trajectory of the object to change because like. That's Oumuamua was the first ever interstellar visitor we've had to come from outside our solar system. And um, by now, this object has traveled too far on its path for us to see it anymore. And we can't send a probe to it because we don't have that technology. It was the first interstellar visitor we've ever had. And But what I think is even more awesome is the fact that we live at a time when we actually have the instruments to observe things like this when they happen, which to me raises some very important questions, like has our solar system been visited by objects like this before, and can we predict when the next visitor might come? What else other than comets may visit us from space, and could we send a probe to investigate the next visitor up close? What might we find? These questions are every bit as interesting as the ones posed by science fiction. On top of that, they are actual legitimate questions that we can work on to find the answer to using real life science. And that's the real adventure right there. Carl Sagan once said that he found science to be far more interesting than science fiction because science had the added advantage of actually being true. But regardless, the story will always begin with some imagination within you. So think about that next time you pick up that comic book on artificial intelligence. 
or when you watch the next Avengers movie, that story may be closer to reality than you might think. And if the stories of yesterday can influence the realities of today, what are the kind of stories that can take us to a world beyond today? My name is Afik Abdul Hamid, engineer, explorer, wanderer. Thank you for your time. <laughs>